Let's quickly go to the Lord in prayer one more time, and then we'll get into the Word. Father God, Lord, we depend on you for all things, and right now we are dependent on you to speak through your Holy Spirit the words that you want your people to hear from this message. I acknowledge that I have no skill, talent, or ability that makes me able or worthy. It all has to come from you, and so we look to you, Lord, to supply us right now with your Holy Spirit's power and presence, power to speak the Word and power to hear the Word and allow the Word to impact us. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have been uh, going through a number of sermons focusing on the Ten Commandments and on God giving the Ten Commandments to His people. Uh, In fact, this is the fourth message in this series and only the second message dealing with the actual Ten Commandments. The first two weeks we spent kind of focusing on uh, the context and God's heart as He was delivering the Ten Commandments to His people. And something I shared with you last week, and I want to state again, as I have studied these passages of Scripture, as I have been in prayer about them and and contemplating these things, I believe that the Holy Spirit has been showing me in ways that I have never really acknowledged or seen before that the Ten Commandments are all about covenant relationship with God, a relationship of love with Him. Uh, I, I said last week, and I'll say again, the primary focus of the commandments is not morality. Now, the commandments surely do inform us morally. They give us a framework and a structure in which to live moral lives with one another and in relationship with God. But the point of the commandments is not primarily morality. And neither is the point of the commandments to give us a list of rules to follow so that then we can be measured and assessed based on our performance and our obedience to those rules and be determined where we stand with God. We already know that. Word of God tells us that we stand as sinners before Him and that no man will be declared righteous by keeping the law. Romans 3.23 tells us that we have all fallen short. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we don't measure up by living in obedience to the law. So this isn't just about giving us a a list of do's and don'ts that we have to perform and show God our obedience so that we can hopefully measure up. That's not how relationship with God works. The purpose, the heart, the point of the commandments is establishing covenant relationship with God. And as I have pointed out a number of times, and I keep finding myself going back to these verses throughout the last couple of weeks as I have studied and prepared for these messages, I find myself continuously going back to Exodus chapter 19. And if you'll turn in your Bibles with me there, I want you to see this. And if if you haven't already marked this in your Bible, I encourage you to do so. Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, this is God speaking to His people, and this is what He says to them. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. And as we said several weeks ago, God is drawing their attention back to the miraculous acts that He performed to bring His people out of slavery and out of captivity in Egypt. He is reminding them of what He has done on their behalf so that they could be free. He says, you have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. 
That's important. Look at those words. I brought you to myself, he says. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my what? What does it say? Treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And what came to my mind as I read those words again this week is, this is the wellspring from which the commandments flow. This is where the covenant law flows out of. This declaration on the part of God that he wants these people to belong to him, to be his treasured possession. It is a declaration of loving desire for relationship with them. And I pray that in the last uh, couple of weeks and in last week's message, we were able to catch a glimpse of how the first two commandments reflect God's heart of love towards his people as he, he made it clear that his desire was for the Israelites to belong to him alone, that they would not give themselves in worship to any other gods, to any images or anything other than he himself. And this morning we're going to look at the second two commandments, or the third and the fourth commandments. These deal with a person's relationship with God. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The last six deal with our relationship with our fellow men. Exodus 20, verses 7 through 11, and that's really where we're going to spend most of the rest of the message. So if you want to turn to there and hold that, uh, that's really where we're going to spend the rest of our time. Uh, there will be one short uh, deviation back to the earlier part of Exodus later on. But Exodus 27 through 11 says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day. This is the fourth commandment then. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath day, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals or the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So, the third commandment deals with using God's name. You, verse 7, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, I don't know about you, but often when I have read this commandment, what my mind primarily focuses on and goes to is that this is a commandment from God. This is God forbidding us from using his name as an expletive using his name as a way of cursing. Um, and certainly that understanding would be contained within the heart of what this commandment means. But that is not really the, the soul or the, uh, the primary focus of this commandment. Uh, and, and I would say also, you know, I don't know that there's much more offensive. There's much that I, I find more offensive than somebody using the name of God as a curse word. I don't know about you, but that goes right through me. I, I, not that I particularly want to hear 
curse words of, of any kind, but I would rather hear just about any other word than to hear someone take God's name and use it as a, as a way to curse with. Uh, but there is more, again, there is more intended in this commandment than just a prohibition against using God's name as a cuss word. Let's go back and look at verse 2. Go back to Exodus chapter 20 and look at verse 2. And take note of how God begins his delivery of the commandments. Exodus 2, or Exodus 22 says, I am, and your Bible probably says the Lord, right? In that verse you're looking at, I am the Lord. Okay, and I explained this a little bit last week, but I want to go over it again. Any time that you're reading in your Bible and you see the words, the Lord, here's what's going on there. The Hebrew people held the name of God in such high regard, in such reverence, that they would not speak or even write God's name. And so what they would do is they would find just about any other way of referring to God rather than use his name because they regarded his name as so sacred that they did not want to speak it or even write it because it was such a holy thing. And so when you find in your word, when you're reading through the Bible and you find a place that says the Lord, what you're reading is a substitution for the given name of God, which is Yahweh in Hebrew. We're probably more familiar with the uh, Latin transliteration of that, which is Jehovah. But when you read the words, the Lord, you can understand as you read that, what's being spoken there, what's being referred to there is God by his name, Yahweh. The name that God says here in Exodus 22, it, it should read like this, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He's identifying himself. He's giving the people his name. And the name that he uses here is the same name that God spoke to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And so if you want to hold your thumb there at, at, at Exodus chapter 20 and you want to leaf back to, to chapter 3, I want you to look at Exodus 3 verses 13 through 15. And just a quick uh, context so that we know where, what's going on here. Moses has encountered God in the wilderness. God is speaking to Moses out of a burning bush, a bush that was seemed to be on fire but was not being consumed. And he's commanding Moses to go back to Egypt and to declare both to the Israelite people and to Pharaoh that God had declared his people were to be freed. And Moses was going to be the one to lead them out of captivity. And as Moses then stands there in this moment where he's being commissioned by God, where he's being called by God to go back to Egypt, he really doesn't want to do this. He's kind of arguing with God and he's finding all kinds of reasons why God should maybe rethink this plan of sending him. But he's asking some questions. And so Moses says to God in, in Exodus 3 verse 13, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am Yahweh. Yahweh has sent me to you. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the Lord, 
the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. What name is God saying? This is my name forever. I am Yahweh. And so this name is sacred. Not only because it is the name by which God names himself and calls himself and indicates that he is to be known by, but it is also sacred because it holds within it all of the attributes that God displays and makes himself known by to his people. One of my commentaries says this, I am, or Yahweh, is an ample container into which The great truths revealed by Moses and through the Exodus have been packed. I am the Holy One. I am the God of the Covenant. I am Redeemer. I am Deliverer. I am Judge. I am the caring God of daily providence. I am the God of reconciliation who brings his people to himself. Any particular misuse of the divine name would deny or scorn any one of these great fundamentals. Therefore, since each is an aspect of who or what God is, any misuse of his name is a personal insult to him. Also, what is intended here is a warning to God's people against taking oaths or making promises in God's name and then not fulfilling them. The Bible exposition commentary says this, your name stands for your character and your reputation, what you are and what you do. When you say that someone has a bad name, you're not criticizing what's written on his birth certificate. Instead, you are warning me that the man can't be trusted. If God is the greatest being in the universe, then his name is the greatest name and must be honored. The first petition of the Lord's Prayer is, Hallowed be thy name. People blaspheme God's name by using vulgar language, but also using God's name in making a promise or taking an oath and then not fulfilling that commitment is cheapening his name and blaspheming God. And again, remember that this is all primarily about relationship. Just as Yahweh would not allow his image to be cast into an idol as he spoke in the second commandment. And he would not allow people to have any sense of reducing the enormity of who he is or of containing his power or having him in a position where they can manipulate him and control him in the same way He would not allow or tolerate his name to be diminished or disparaged, resulting in a loss of reverence for who Yahweh is and what Yahweh has done. And I believe it's very sobering that this command is followed by a warning from the Lord in verse 7, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Clearly, this is something that God takes very seriously. And therefore, it is something that we need to take very seriously as well. And I will add to that this. When we talk about people that we love, that we have respect for, Do we talk about them in ways that would diminish or disparage them? Of course not. I remember as a kid, 
uh, going to church at like coming Christian. Church was over. Everybody was filing out. I was in the foyer in the back looking for mom and dad because church was over and it was time to go. And so I wanted to get going. And I was looking around for my parents and I couldn't find them. And I saw one of my friends in the youth group and I turned to him and I said, hey, have you seen my old man? And my dad was standing right behind me. (laughs) And I heard about it on the way home. Dad said, you know, I don't think I would have ever thought to talk about my father or refer to my father like that. Now, I didn't necessarily mean it as a way of disrespecting dad. I I really just meant, have you seen my dad? But it made him feel disrespected. And I never referred to him in that way again. But you get what I'm saying. When you love somebody, when you hold them in high regard and and, and, in, in respect, you don't speak about them like in a way that will diminish or disparage them. You know, I don't refer to Jeanette as my old lady. The old battle axe, the ball and chain, right? We don't do that. Why not? Well, mostly because I like to have a happy home and if I, you know. But we don't do that because we love each other. We don't talk about each other like that. If I saw my kids come into the room and I said, here come my brats. I mean, no, no. I don't want people hearing me talk about my kids like that. I love my kids. I want people to think well of my kids. So if we aren't going to speak about people that we love, human beings who are flawed, if we're not going to speak about people like that, why in the world would we ever think to take God's name and use it in a way that would diminish or disparage who he is? If we love him, we're going to hold him in regard and speak his name with reverence. The fourth commandment, then, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day. Now, let's be clear, the Sabbath, the word Sabbath, it simply means rest. And it's interesting to me that the Israelite people had already been practicing the observance of a Sabbath. Uh, Back in Exodus chapter 16, God begins to send the manna, the bread from heaven. Uh, If you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go back and read that. But God begins to send the manna down to the people on a daily basis so they had food to eat. And they were to gather the manna six days out of the week. But on the sixth day, they were to gather twice as much as what they normally did, right? Right? And so the seventh day was a day of rest, and they didn't get any manna that day. They weren't to go out and gather manna that day. It was a Sabbath. It was a rest. But here in Exodus chapter 20, God is now formalizing this observance of the Sabbath, and he's bringing it in and making it part of the covenantial law that he is establishing with his people. See, every sixth day they were to, or excuse me, every seventh day they were to rest. Um, Then verses 8 through 11 says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now again, if we're really going to understand what God is commanding here, and we're going to understand what God is seeking to achieve here, we need to take a look at the word holy and make sure that we are understanding it in the way that God means for us to. I believe most frequently when we hear the word holy or we use the word holy, we are using it as a synonym for righteousness. Would you agree with me on that? That frequently when we hear the word holy, we think of moral perfection, right? We're thinking of something that is righteous, that is morally high, that is uh, upright and good, okay? Uh, Would you agree with me that that's how we use the word holy? But that is not the literal meaning of the word. 
the literal meaning of the word holy and the way that the Lord is using the word holy as he gives this commandment, it means set apart. The Sabbath was to be a holy day in that it was to be a day that was set apart from, that was distinct from, that was separated and special from the other six days of the week. And remember what the Lord said to his people back in chapter 19, verses 5 through 6. We've already read these verses. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, and a what? What does it say? Holy nation. They were to be a people who were set apart from all the other peoples of the world world, to belong to God, to live in covenant relationship with God. And think about the tabernacle and then later on the temple. They were holy places because they were set apart as the place where God's presence dwelt and where people would come to meet with God to worship him and to offer sacrifices to him. The objects within the temple and the tabernacle, they were holy objects because they were set apart and distinct. They were not used for any common purpose. The priests did not go over to the table of showbread and make a sandwich on it when it was lunchtime. It was a holy object and it was used for nothing else but the worship of God. And so in the same fashion as the Israelite people, in the same fashion as the tabernacle and the objects and implements of worship, they were holy, they were set apart, and the Sabbath was to be a day set apart, separate, and distinct from all the other days of the week. The Lord goes on then in verses 9 through 11. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy, set it apart. So what's going on here with this commandment? Is, is God just really concerned that his people get enough rest? They take Saturday and they, they take a nap, catch up on their beauty sleep. Is that what God's focused on and concerned about here? Well, again, no, there's more going on here than just the idea of his people having a physical rest. And, and I know I've been referring to a lot of commentaries in this sermon series, but I've, I've really been finding my commentaries helpful and giving me different perspectives. So I have been using them a little more than what I normally do. And the teacher's Bible commentary says this, for the Jew, the Sabbath was a symbol and sacred reminder of the covenant between God and his chosen people. It was a day of rest in remembrance of God's late rest after his labor of creation. It was, in its Sinai context, a weekly day of thanksgiving for the Egyptian deliverance. It was a day of sanctification. It was a prophetic day as noted in the grace with the Sabbath meals. It was a day of joy and celebration of God's goodness. It was a day of worship, of special religious services, of the reading of God's word and later of other religious books. The keeping of the Sabbath has long been viewed 
as a mark of differentiation between Jews and other races. And again, coming back to the same theme over and over again, this is all about relationship. This is not just God giving the people some arbitrary rule saying you can't work on Saturday. Have you ever heard the saying, and I, I can't even remember where I first heard it, but have you ever heard the saying, the important becomes the victim of the immediate? You ever heard that expression? The idea is that even things that we are inclined to view as very important in our lives, those things tend to get pushed aside by the immediate demands that we have on our time. How easily do you become preoccupied with the immediate concerns of your daily life? How, how frequently do you come, become preoccupied with, you know, a, a to-do list as long as your arm? You've got these things and these chores and these projects you need to get done around the house. You've got these phone calls you got to make and these bills you got to pay. And you've got these practices you got to get your kids to or your grandkids to and this event and that event and you got this person you're supposed to call and you got all these things that you're supposed to do. And how often do you find yourself with this list of immediate concerns pounding on the door of your life, demanding your attention right now, how frequently do the things that you know are important get pushed aside because the immediate is demanding your attention? And so the important becomes the victim of the immediate. And I think we can all relate to that to some degree. We become preoccupied with all the stuff we got to do, all the stuff we got going on. And then we add into that mix the things that we want to do, the stuff we do for fun and leisure and relaxation and enjoyment. Y'all know me well enough to know I love to fish. I can't hardly stand to walk by a body of water without throwing a line in it. I love to fish. My wife will say it's an obsession more than anything else. I love to fish, but I also know that I can become so preoccupied with hunting or with fishing that important things sometimes don't get done, right? <laughs> How often do we allow all of the stuff that presses in and demands our attention to crowd out our relationship with God, to crowd out our focus on Him. And see, God knows that's true about us. The book of Colossians tells us that we are made by Him and for Him. He made us for relationship. But He knows that if we are left to our own inclinations, we become distracted by our immediate earthly goings on and we often neglect to give sufficient attention to him and to our relationship with him. Therefore, he set apart a day and made it holy. A day that was separate from all the other days of the week that was distinct in that it was to be a day when all of the business and busyness of the, his people's lives was paused. And they would spend that day in relationship with him, focusing on him. See, the Sabbath was meant to be a day of worship. It was meant to be a day of self-examination and introspection in regard to a person's relationship with Yahweh. 
It was an exercise of faith in that as all the other peoples around them continued to pursue wealth and continued to pursue their needs and all of the things that people want to have in life, the Jews would sit back and say, God, we trust you that even when we are not scrambling frantically to make sure that we get all the stuff that we want and need to have, that if we will spend today focused on you and worshiping you, you will supply what we need in the other six days that we labor. And so it was an expression of faith. Likewise, it was a day of gratitude and thanksgiving, thanking God for his faithful provision. And finally, it stood as a visible difference between the Israelites Yahweh's people and the pagan people that they were surrounded by. As we conclude, I just want to say that in the book of Isaiah, God said of his people that they would be a light to the Gentiles. And then Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, he says that we are to be the light of the world. And the visibly different and distinct set apart way in which we live out covenant relationship with Yahweh is the way in which our light shines into the world and is visible to the people around us. The way that we worship God as God alone the way in which we do not give our life's devotion to any earthly thing, to any image or even any human relationship as being the number one priority in our life. The way that we show love and reverence to God in the way we speak about Him and use His name. The way in which we set aside the busyness of our life in order to stop and focus ourselves on Yahweh and on His Son, Jesus Christ, to worship Him and seek after relationship with Him. All of these things resulting from living in obedience to the commandments that God gave to His people, they testify to the world around us who Yahweh is to us, what He has done for us, and who he can be for them and do for them. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted that relationship invitation that Jesus has offered to us, to know God, to abide in him, to have his spirit abide in us, and you need to accept that invitation this morning, we invite you to come to a be obedient to what God has said in His Word to receive Jesus Christ in faith through baptism, for your sins to be forgiven, for the gift of eternal life to be yours, the gift of the Holy Spirit to be yours. Or maybe you're here this morning and you need some prayer, or you have a testimony to share. But if, if the Spirit is, is prompting you, if the Spirit is leading you this morning, we just encourage you greatly. Follow through with what the Spirit is leading. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.